Hello, is the mic on? Yes, it is. I think we should uh, start. And uh, I was asked by the organizers to uh, chair this today's keynote, and I said I will be happy to do that. It, indeed, it is indeed my honor and pleasure to present today's keynote. When I uh, arrived at the very first Dubrovnik conference here in uh, Dubrovnik in 2002, I didn't knew all the organizers of this conference, but it became the start of a long and dear friendship and scientific collaboration between the group from Zagreb, the organizers of this conference, and our group of researchers in Aalborg University in Denmark. And to some extent, today's keynote is a result of this fantastic collaboration. Today's keynote started her study in Zagreb, and then we were very lucky in Denmark because she decided to go to Denmark. And she has stayed in Denmark since, and now uh, when I present Dr. Eva Ritjen Skov, you can hear that uh, Eva has both a Croatian family name and a Danish family name. But that's beside the point. The point here is more the scientific content because in those early days where I and others were concentrated on renewable energy and the green transition and whatever, it was not called then, but it's called now and this and that, fully decarbonized societies and all this, we were looking mostly into the easy part of it. The easy part being the heating and the electricity sectors. But today's keynote, immediately when you started, Eva, we're looking into the difficult part of the green transition, that being how to decarbonize the transport sector. So you made your PhD on a thesis where you looked into electrofuels, it was called, uh, those, those many years ago when you did your uh, PhD. And now this word of electrofuel have gradually uh, being referred to as now power to X. And uh, today's keynote have various uh, positions in committees, have reached very high awards also for your work. So uh, I'm very, very happy to uh, look forward for all of us to hear about power to X in a systems perspective. So please, all of you, give a warm welcome to Dr. Eva Ritjen Skov. Well, uh, thank you, Henrik, for this lovely introduction. Uh, it was really, really to the detail uh, from the historic perspectives. Um, I would like to extend my gratitude to the conference organizer for the invitations uh, for me uh, to give this lecture and to the, address this esteemed uh, audience. I would also like to congratulate the conference organizers for doing so many successful stereos conferences throughout the year, and uh, this one in Dubrovnik being close to heart for many of us. I was, as uh, Henrik said, uh, studied in, uh, in Zagreb at the uh, Faculty of Mechanical Engineering uh, uh, and Naval Architecture, and I was actually part of the organizing committee a long time ago. It's been some years. So the topic that I would like to talk about today kept me busy for the last 10 years. Uh, during my master thesis and PhD, and also now being associate professor uh, at the Aalborg University in uh, Copenhagen campus, which is a story of its own. So I'll use next 40 minutes uh, to talk about this and try to engage you into insights and perspectives that I believe are of importance for reaching our climate targets. With further ado, let's start. And I will start by unlocking the energy uh, transition landscape. And I would like to highlight that geographical focus uh, today is primarily going to be uh, European Union and Denmark. Uh, and I would like to discuss three points here. 
Firstly, we all know that the direct displacement of fossil uh, fuels is not possible uh, with the renewable uh, energy to the simplistic way. So we need to integrate variable renewables uh, in a bit more complex uh, approach. Secondly, I don't want to be a bearer of the bad news, but we are behind. Uh, we are off the track. And uh, even though we have a very ambitious and uh, uh, targets and uh, necessary targets in our policies, we also have a very uh, slow implementation rate and it needs to follow a bit better our targets. And thirdly, we are also witnessing actually a positive development in the policy part because policies are also gaining a bit more holistic perspectives uh, these days and the targets are more detailed across uh, the energy sector in specific parts. So let me elaborate a bit on the first point. If I quote uh, Irina, uh, the success of energy transition depends on transformation of the global energy sector from fossil-based sources to zero carbon sources. And we know if we use a biomass, it's a very simple equation. We can directly displace the fossil fuels uh, with biomass. But we are also all aware that biomass is restricted resource. It's also the only renewable resource that can be depleted. And if we add a sustainability issue to it, the equation uh, is not adding up. And the integration of the variable electricity in the system can be challenging uh, because when we talk about 100% renewable systems, uh, it's not really uh, direct that we can uh, implement because we need to think about how to build the system in a right way that it, we can integrate all renewables that we need. But one thing is sure, the future is going to be electric because we have a variable uh, electricity uh, that we will have to use in order to design our system in the best way. And it's going to be a crucial part of our energy transition. The energy transition is off the track. Um, we are off the track because of the COVID-19 of course, and the war of Ukraine that further compounded the challenges that we are facing. If we look towards the renewable energy uh, policy targets in 2030, where was it? Sorry, it's always interesting when you use a fix and uh, we are not uh, fully uh, in, char in charge of it. Um, if we look towards the 2030, we can see the implementation rate that we have on the renewables up to 2020 was uh, not the same type of curve that we need to do from now on to 2030. So this curve needs to be steeper, which calls for the higher implementation rate of the renewables than we are having today. And actually, this is a very critical part that we are dealing with right now, because if we are looking into the member states, uh, according to Ember, the solar permitting is ranging from 12 to 48 months, and if we are looking on the onshore wind, it's ranging from 30 to 120 months. Croatia being at the bottom of the list on both of this. We can do better and we need to do better. And according to the World Energy uh, Transition Outlook for 2023, tracking progress of the key energy system components is also off the track and it's not looking that good. And the complexion of the transition and the rebounds effects that we are experiencing, of course, having the toll on the progress. But let's talk a bit about the positive parts because they are positive parts. Finally, uh, back in 2020, the European Commission has rolled out the European Green Deal being the biggest policy package in pursuit for the climate targets. This followed by the Fit for 55 and then Repower EU last year. So accelerating the permitting processes for, for renewables is actually now being pretty a uh, critical part that the European Commission is trying uh, to deal with. We don't know exactly how it's going to take place, but uh, it's very important that uh, they are also uh, aware of this. And the policy package that were presented throughout these uh, few last year actually finally acknowledged the complexity of the transport sector. We know that we had the renewable targets for, for the transport sector as a whole, but transport sector is pretty complex uh, sector to deal with. So now we can look at the transport through three lenses. We're looking at primarily from cars and vans perspective, and then we also have aviation and uh, marine as a focus with the refuel EU and EU, uh, fuel EU initiatives. 
And Europe is seeking uh, energy sovereignty, which is a very, very important part and realization that we are, need to have going forward to the future. With that being said, the Repower EU last year, of course, uh, focused on uh, diversification and energy savings and implementation of renewables in order to go away from uh, dependency on the Rus uh, Russian fossil fuels. Uh, and we tried to do this before 2030. Large hydrogen demand is introduced uh, as a part of the diversification of the gas supply. Green hydrogen, partly being domestically produced and partly being imported. And I really have a high hopes that we actually can import green hydrogen because in total 20 million tons is a lot uh, being 10 imported uh, outside of European borders. And at the same time, we also introduced a lot of uh, LNG, which could technically lead to uh, some stranded assets for many of the countries that are investing as a, of course, reaction to a crisis that we are dealing right now. But the most important is, as we are going forward, that the focus and the strategic di direction for the, each of the country is to keep investing in the renewables and having the renewables investments on the top of the list. This brings me to the systems thinking, and I would like to talk about the three points that I think really much fit into how we have and how we need to deal uh, with the energy transition of the energy sector. First of all, uh, the disconnection to interconnections. So system thinking for is trying to shift the focus from viewing issues individually uh, and recognizing this different web of interconnections that we are dealing with among various elements. It highlights that everything is linked because everything is linked. And we cannot disregard the relationships that exist in the system in order to find uh, the right uh, solutions for the complex problems that we are dealing with. Then we have linear to circular uh, challenge of change because linear thinking is a cause-effect uh, approach. And if we talk about the circularity, then we also recognize that there are flow of influence within the system that are reappearing and are going to have a continuous effect. Uh, and in order to uh, see the right solution, we actually need to recognize what effects and loops we have in the system. And then analysis and synthesis. And even though we do work, at least I do work with energy system analysis, in this point, it's not, not exactly the same. But analysis is trying to deal with individual components of the system and trying to find the solutions for individual parts. But if we don't look at the system as a whole, an entire system in a holistic way, then we have a tendency to dis disregard some of the solutions that are maybe beneficial for the parts of the uh, energy system, but not necessarily as a system as a whole. So trying to have this holistic understanding actually brings the innovation for finding the solution when we take a uh, big picture in mind. So if we look at... Uh, Oh, sorry. If we look at the energy system, we talk about historically for an energy system as a silo uh, perspective. Uh, so we look at the each individual sectors and we find a supply uh, for the sectors because this was perfectly possible in a system where we have a fossil fuels as a starting point. Fossil fuels are providing flexibility on the resource side, and of course we could create a separate supplies in each of the energy uh, sectors. However, when we look towards the future, we are having a renewable uh, uh, energy systems, hopefully, which is what we are aiming at, but then we need to start breaking uh, these silos and start to think about uh, system and find the solutions that are best for the system and not necessarily for uh, individual parts uh, as well. So more specifically, talk about the smart energy systems. So thinking across the sectors is a very important part of the energy transition because in this way we can provide the flexibility that was lost on the resource size before that we had and we need to now create the flexibility within the system. So different types of cross-sectorial technologies can then bring more efficient, more robust and also potentially more affordable energy systems in the future. And Henry, correct me if I'm wrong, 
but approximately 11 years after you have introduced the smart energy system concept, uh, in 2020, European Commission has finally recognized that integrated energy systems are a way to go, and they published actually an EU strategy for energy systems integration. So just uh, a simple uh, thing is that Academics are ahead of time and sometimes needs a bit of a convincing to get ahead also on the policy uh, part as well. But it is recognized now. And not only on the system part, but also when it comes to the policies. So what is power to X? Um, and why is it relevant in the system thinking perspective? Well, power to X is one of those cross-sectorial technologies that can provide the flexibility in the system. As Henry mentioned, uh, it has many names. And actually, there is a Danish saying, a dear child has many names, and certainly it does. And if you look across the policies, and I've been following this quite uh, dearly throughout the years, you have both the power to X, hydrogen-derived synthetic fuels, RFMBOs, electrofuels, eel fuels, and I can continue for a while because there is a plenty of uh, examples for it. Um, but it is basically an indirect electrification. So it's an option for integrating uh, renewables in a form of uh, cheap uh, fuel storage. Uh, and then we have an opportunity pr to produce different end fuels that then can be used on the tr in the transport sector primarily, but also uh, in industry as well. So production of the green hydrogen is of course the first step. And uh, by using electrolysis as a technology, we can produce hydrogen that can further be de uh, derived to different types of end fuels that we need for aviation, marine, and uh, uh, also the road transport to the extent uh, that is necessary based on to how much electrification can actually be achieved. But power to X is not only a simple uh, example of the cross uh, sectorial linkage because it is could say the third, it has a third dimension because it doesn't integrate only electricity and transport sector and the industry, it also integrates the heat sector because you can use the excess heat not only from the electrolysis but also from the carbon capture and also from the fuel synthesis. And if you have a district heating uh, network, then you actually can use the waste heat. You can also establish industrial symbiosis uh, and in that way uh, use uh, as well uh, the waste heat. And now probably if some of you are wondering, well, it is a hydrogen. Why are you talking about it as something else than hydrogen? Uh, why it has a different, uh, different name? And is it an old wine in a new bottle? Well, fact check, it is an old wine because technology was developed more than 200 years ago uh, and nothing is gonna change that fact. So we know this for many, many years. But I think I would like to highlight that actually in the naming and the concept and approach we are using it is a very, very important. So 200 years ago, we are aware of the electrolysis, but for many years, actually many decades, hydrogen has been present in the energy policy on the discussion tables and so on between the different stakeholders, but it had a different focus. And the focus was uh, more towards the transport and uh, direct for personal transportation and also for domestic heating. Let me assure that Denmark is not any different than EU. We, have a, we are a country that has invested the most in the hydrogen research uh, in GDP terms over the years. But just a few weeks ago, uh, Denmark has also decided to close uh, hydrogen fueling stations and left 136 cars without the fuel. Why did we do that? Because there are different solutions that are better and we are aware of the technology. So if we are talking about the personal transportation, obviously the electrification is the best way to go. Also, if we are talking about domestic heating, there are better choices that are out there uh, and we are also aware of those. And obviously one thing that we maybe didn't discuss over the many decades is that if we actually want to apply hydrogen directly and we want to use the green hydrogen, then there is this challenges with the material flows because you need to produce electrolyzers, but then you also need to produce many, many fuel cells. And I don't think this is something that we have discussed enough when we talk about uh, hydrogen, uh, both in the policies, but also uh, in the academic circles, maybe that much. So 
I just want to uh, bit discuss about and present to you why did it gain so much attention in Denmark uh, over uh, the last uh, years. So we all know that Denmark is a forerunner of the green transition, has successfully implementing the variable renewables for many years. The energy transition has been motivated by different um, agendas, and one of the recent ones, you could say, is the system integration perspectives. And this type of discussions have been raised upon uh, stakeholders in the period between 2016 and 2018, where this system thinking and cross-sectorial integration really became something that many uh, stakeholders have started uh, to think about when they were considering what solutions to go with. And then having this massive elephant in the room, being transport sector that Denmark really didn't pay that much attention about. It was the only sector that didn't have any reductions in CO2 emissions and we were successfully dealing both with electricity and the heating sector. Um, many stakeholders start to talking about the transport sector and what is a way to go all the way through with the renewable energy in it. And while hydrogen probably had a really bad sales pitch in Denmark, many stakeholders could finally see themselves in a power to X value chain that is pretty long. And with a strong wind industry and a big success in the wind, uh, power to X seemed like a perfect next candidate uh, to go on a new wind adventure. And new relations that occurred through this process was actually quite interesting because you had in the room finally people like shipping uh, produ uh, operators and then uh, renewable energy uh, producers that were sitting together and actually discussing what is the way to go. And this, is not, there was not, this was not a typical setup that you would see across many, many years. And then finally, uh, after some years of discussion, Denmark published the Power to X strategy. Not hydrogen strategy, as European Commission requested and many member states have committed to it, they actually published a Power to X strategy. And now I'd like to talk about 10 recent highlights uh, on the journey to the Power to X strategy. And I'm not gonna go through all individual points, but I'm gonna move my mouse so you can follow uh, how it happened. And uh, this is a very simplistic illustration of what happened throughout the two years. Uh, it has many more details behind, but then we could have a three-day three course maybe uh, at some point. But uh, it kind of started uh, in 2019 when Parsex really landed on everybody's lips in Denmark. And me being working with it for many years, not necessarily always referring it to as power to x I thought it was really amazing because out of the sun, literally from one day to another, everybody started talking about it. Everybody knew everything about it, which of course is not necessarily the fact, but it, it became really a part of uh, the discussions. And how it all started is basically in 2019, Denmark had a climate elections that resulted in a very ambitious target of 70% reductions of the CO2 emissions. And then Danish government actually engaged together with the stakeholders and created climate partnerships. And the climate partnerships and then identified uh, different, it was 13 partnerships that identified different solutions that are necessary, also from industrial uh, perspective to achieve the 70% reduction goal. And then uh, we had actually the first power to X hearing that happened in, uh, in the government, which was uh, really a mind-blowing thing because even though we have tried to communicate for many years uh, to, uh, to politicians as well that this is necessary, they were been very busy of trying to talk about the electrification of the transport sector, which was an extremely important part because we really haven't been talking about transport sector at all. But then we finally had a power to X hearing and a memor memorandum of understanding between different actors, including Oil Boy University, was presented there to highlight that we need this technology as a part of the solution for 2030 and further uh, towards the fully renewable systems. And this actually happened before uh, the partnerships came with this idea. So you could feel that there was a notion of different uh, things happening throughout um, and uh, they came with the recommendations as well. And then the Danish uh, energy at that point now being called Green Power uh, Denmark has uh, 
quickly came with the suggestions of how the power to x strategy should look like. They gathered big, important industrial players. They actually created uh, the power to x partnership, which grew uh, very quickly to almost 50 uh, members. And then at the end of this two years period, this was actually a lot of things going on and waiting, and of course Corona happened, and a lot of things uh, was going on between. The Danish industry also joined the dialogue and they actually also presented the suggestions of how the power to x strategy should look like with also focus on CCS. And now, two years after the 2019, we were standing with more than 150 actors that were interested uh, on working with the power to x and implementing power to x in Denmark. And then finally, also the market dialogue and at the end, uh, the power to x strategy. And very quickly after the power to x strategy, the power to x uh, agreement also came. And now I would like to see you talk a bit about where we are today, because it's been some time from when we actually had these things in place. We do have an ambitious target. First of all, the 2030 target is very, very ambitious, but also we put ourselves some additional ambitious targets, which is four to six uh, gigawatt of electrolysis that is part of the power to x uh, agreement. Now, if I actually reflect on what our analysis in our uh, research group have that been going for many, many years, and we look into 100% renewable Denmark, or where we do it occasionally every few years uh, to uh, regain and to implement the new knowledge, we actually in 2015 presented a 100% uh, renewable scenario for Denmark where we had, if I remember correctly, almost 8 gigawatt of electrolysis. And you should see the discussion that was when we presented this uh, scenario where the wind uh, industry said that this was never going to happen. So there was no possibility that they can upscale the wind uh, in the pace that we were asking, and uh, this is never going to come to life. But then, out of the sudden, after we have received this critique, okay, maybe we were too ambitious, it was too big of a, a, a chunk to, uh, to chew on. Then we created a new scenario uh, some years after as a part of the uh, answer of reaching 70% reduction goal. And then we go a bit more uh, conservative, we implement more energy efficiency measure, not conservative necessarily everywhere, but when it comes to the electrolysis, and end up that we need only around two gigawatt of electrolysis in Denmark in 2030. But the strategy uh, and the agreement saying four to six. And of course, when we look at the energy system, we talk about the meeting the domestic demand uh, and not necessarily meeting also the export uh, potential. So you can see that this scale is changing a bit. But I can assure you that there were not that many discussions about that we actually can achieve four to six gigawatts because of course we were gonna do it because we also had an agreement uh, to install a lot of offshore wind. So with the agreement came a lot of funding opportunities and even though I was probably the only one in the group that was sitting with the power to x projects up until 2019, I think from at least last two, three years, every each member of our research group is now having a power to x project because the amount of funding uh, that was also for the research and also for the industry really, really grew significantly uh, throughout uh, this period. And then also as a result of the agreement, the 170 million euros uh, market-based tender was uh, started that is going to work over the 10 years. And actually the tender deadline was the 1st of September. So I'm very curious checking the news to see is there anything happening and are they gonna publish who actually have requested it? Nothing yet. But it is something that is potentially going uh, to make uh, a difference when it comes to the implementation. And this significant offshore agreements, not only nine to four potential of 14 gigawatts, but also SBIR declaration that has uh, been signed by Denmark, Belgium, Netherlands, and Germany, going towards 150 gigawatts by 2050. So the scale is growing significantly. 
And when I said that the power to X landed on everyone in everybody's lips in 2019, I also mean it because it literally landed also on the lips of the Danish queen that has presented it as a part of her traditional New Year speech, pointing out that we need these fuels for reaching the targets in 2030 and long uh, term after. This New Year speech by the Queen was also followed by a Prime Minister's uh, New Year speech where she targeted that we need the green domestic aviation by 2025 with the hope that this is going to speed up the process of implementation of the electrolyzers in the system. As a system or energy planner, I, I believe there are better solutions than providing a domestic aviation in the small country as Denmark, but there is an argument that the climate impact of investing in the uh, uh, train infrastructure uh, is going to be more impactful, which is based on the analysis that were done in Norway, which has a very different geography than Denmark, if you're a bit aware. Denmark is very flat and very small, so actually establishing the uh, the train uh, infrastructure uh, with a high-speed train would be possible. But never mind, it's important to acknowledge that there are stakeholders that are invested in it and we need to find a solution where it makes everybody happy. And being a very small part of the CO2 emissions and the demand as such in comparison to the international aviation, it was a good, uh, I could say, nudge for uh, the investors to go this way. And actually it worked, or it didn't. We'll see a bit in, the, in a bit. And then we finally had the increased focus on electrification. We want to have one million EVs in, the, in 2030. Long term, we'll have much more uh, integration of uh, electricity in the transport sector. If we look at the numbers, really, every third car in March was uh, in Denmark uh, that was sold was electric. And overall, from the parking lot, we only have 4.6% of EVs. But we do very have strong uh, charging infrastructure that is apparently uh, even stronger than the one in Norway, and we all know how many Norwegians uh, are driving EVs. But then we have a focus also on the green shipping uh, as well, and a big focus on electrification of the ferries. Um, the priority is that uh, natural choice should be investing in the zero emission uh, ships uh, in 2030. And the highlight of the month was, of course, launching of Laura Mask, which was uh, the first world's methanol uh, container ship that was uh, parked in the Copenhagen Harbor and launched by a uh, president of the uh, European Commission. And this actually represents a big step and a big journey into uh, mask uh, being carbon neutral and shipping being carbon neutral uh, in 2050. But maybe we were a bit struck by optimism bias uh, because if we actually look the amount of projects that have been uh, piling on the list uh, has been growing every day. And right now, uh, the screenshot is uh, 43 projects, more than 17 gigawatts of electrolysis that is planned to be installed. Only five is actually uh, in operation, approximately one megawatt. So we have a long way to go. And actually, some, uh, some information that I got was that only well, less than 10% of the, the project as well uh, have uh, funding, uh, final funding that can go to the investment uh, decision. But let's talk about the perspectives. And I'll use the, some time now uh, with the perspectives. We need, or we need, we need a lot of electrolysis, and electrolysis needs wind in the back uh, because obviously we can have power to X without wind uh, or without solar for that matter. Um, we do need a lot, and the targets are pretty ambitious, going to 100 gigawatts in EU in 2030. 
And then we have the hydrogen infrastructure uh, that was uh, initiated, a hydrogen, uh, European hydrogen backbone that was initiated by 32 uh, infrastructure operators that joined and aim to establish the hydrogen infrastructure throughout the Europe by repurposing 60% and uh, establishing 40% of the new grid. And I'll finalize a bit uh, with that we need to do it smart and we need to do it efficient. We are standing with a big task, not only with the transport sector, but also with the whole thing, and we know that we are not really on the track. But I want to highlight that the power, te power to x technologies are not only uh, a choice, but they are actually a necessity if we want to go through uh, with the having 100% renewable systems in the future. And this will make uh, the system more resilient and it will increase the energy security and also the economic growth. But in order to meet these targets, we need a lot of investments in uh, renewables. We also need uh, investments in electrolysis and we actually need also the production capacity for establishing all the electrolysis that we want uh, to implement in the system. And Helotopsu being a strong uh, player in Denmark is actually uh, building the factory for high temperature electrolyzers right now. As a part of the Synergies project that we worked on uh, throughout the last few years, which was a EU-wide project, we looked how to establish 100% renewable systems in 2050, which resulted by having around 450 gigawatts of electrolysis, uh, which obviously calls for large uh, investments in the renewables. And we currently have only 32 gigawatts of offshore wind, including UK. So the speed rate of upscaling every year needs to be at least on average 11 gigawatts until 2030. And then we can have a chat where we are and how to go towards uh, 2050. The another positive twist though here was the policies. So with the Renewable Energy Directive and the uh, delegated act, finally we parked the idea that we can produce uh, hydrogen and e-fuels by using only excess electricity. We need a dedicated renewable uh, to do this. And this was recognized by having an additionality requirement and geographical uh, requirement. And this is a very important step that was taken by European Commission because this will stop the cannibalization of the renewable electricity uh, being used uh, for electrolysis when it should be used directly uh, for the electrification. And if we look at the hydrogen infrastructure, According to Agora uh, and given them more than 90% of uh, German existing gas grid is going to be obsolete in the future. And hydrogen alone cannot justify the preservation of it. And similar studies have uh, confirmed the same, that the, that the infrastructure, uh, gas infrastructure in the future will not have the same role that it had before. And the one thing that really was uh, important when the studies about the hydrogen infrastructure were presented, of course, was the economic perspectives. And obviously, it is cheaper when you account uh, that hydrogen is easier and cheaper, to, well, not easier, but cheaper to, to transport than electricity. Um, and yes, it's a minimal investment in comparison to the offshore wind that we need to invest, but is it safer? I really like to, and I'm not really convinced, the more that I talk with the safety experts, it's not really uh, convincing or it's actually not comforting at all. But we are heading towards this adventure, so hopefully it's gonna be done in a proper way. Um, and only a fraction of gas demand that we have today is gonna be directly displaced by hydrogen. Uh, so we need to uh, plan it right, and we need to not fall in the trap of establishing hydrogen infrastructure and use it for the wrong purposes uh, when we know that there are better solutions out there. So not to lock ourselves uh, in the solutions that are not necessarily a result of a system uh, perspective. And lastly, we do need smart energy systems. Uh, and we need it because we need to look across the sectors. We need to find the flexibility within the system in order to integrate the vast amount of renewables that we need. We need to establish the production facilities close to the man, if that is possible. And we need the comprehensive planning across the infrastructure, not only 
gas or hydrogen, but also the heat and electricity to do it in a proper manner and to minimize overinvestments where they are not necessary. And lasting energy uh, transition is a collective effort and we need to coordinate not only across the municipalities, regions, countries, uh, to get the best outcome, we also should not forget the people. And as an engineers, we have a tendency to think about that technologies can provide all the solutions and we don't need to think about or discuss about anything else than a technological solution. But energy transition is not only a technological challenge, but it's also a societal one. And people and the stakeholders are driving the implementation of the technologies. So we should not leave anybody behind and the transparency going forward in communicating the plans and the necessity and knowledge sharing is really a crucial part in order to achieve the targets that we have. And that would be all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Eva. And now we have time for questions and comments and discussion points. Who would like to be the first? We have a gentleman there. If we can get a mic to you, uh, raise your hand again, then the mic can find you. Please say your name. And, and Hello. I'm Giovanni Cinti from University of Perugia. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, you spoke about uh, several vectors in beyond hydrogen and you say something about methanol. I know that that's something that is accelerating Denmark. I wonder if you had a more uh, vision about other options like um, ammonia, was there? Yeah. Maybe synthetic methane? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so we had in the period up to uh, 2016, 2017, we talked a lot about uh, going towards the green methanol, uh, methane, sorry, and then using the gas infrastructure in that way, and then forgetting all the efficiency factors in, the, in that part, and then convert that gas into methanol where we need the methanol, uh, and doing it that way. And then the narrative changed a bit because somebody actually did the calculations and figured out, yeah, okay, the willingness of pay still is not as good as the uh, efficiency losses that we have there. Uh, and then the methanol uh, still uh, kept being as a promising fuel for the marine, primarily for the passenger transportation and also for fisheries. Ammonia, of course, is a critical part here because we have restricted CO2 resources and the demand for fuels is really big. So actually being able to implement uh, ammonia in the shipping part uh, in the future is going to be uh, really a way to go in order to uh, deal with the carbon uh, that we don't have uh, to the extent. Uh, and of course, uh, Denmark having some uh, developers there, uh, having uh, working on the ammonia ship um, as well, that hopefully should be, should have been next year, but uh, in 2025 apparently now and methanol, uh, the, the Laura Mask or Mass ship, methanol ship is actually dual fuel ship, uh, fuel ship, so it can uh, also consume other fuel, which is not the aim with it, but, uh, but methanol is gonna be present for a while while the technology is there and also, uh, well, the first round of carbon availability uh, when before it switches to the parts that we actually need to use it, which is not necessarily shipping uh, on the big scale. Since the one behind the first, okay, you're first. Okay, great, good. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for this speech. My name is Jarek Milewski. I am from Warsaw University of Technology from Poland. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, or comment uh, because this is the perspective from European Union, yes, but we are not the only in the world. And uh, now I, 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 I was presenting a similar speech about the United States uh, policy. And if you can comment this for the audience, and because they are a little bit turned back to, from the electricity right now. Just, just your comments about the, the you are not on the, on the one. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, of course, uh, what, what is actually being screamed uh, from the stakeholders in Denmark that obviously the conditions right now in US for investing in electrolysis is much better than they are in EU and they're still waiting for EU's response uh, to, uh, 
uh, to the act uh, that was implemented in US. Um, that, well, you could see that the, the interesting thing right now is that Denmark is fighting to become a part of this play, right? Uh, because we are not necessarily, due to the long process, is going to be first anymore. Now it's a question of what to do and how to do it in the right way. And this is where the cross-sectorial integration can be part. But overall, we are not gonna, the, the cheapest fuel is going to prevail. And the cheapest fuel is probably not going to come necessarily from, uh, from EU uh, when we talk about power to x derived fuels, but it's going to be somewhere uh, on the special uh, dedicated locations in Australia and Chile and uh, locations like that where a lot of ammonia is uh, being planned to be produced for shipping. So we also need to follow where the fuel needs are, uh, and that's going to be also a crucial part when establishing uh, the production facilities because obviously the demand will dictate where uh, it should be uh, produced and how to minimize the transportation of the fuels if, uh, if it can be avoided. Thank you very much. There we was now have a uh, microphone. five more on the list, and you make it uh, six. So I, I will. Microphone, so it is my turn. Yeah, Henry, yeah, there I know, is but uh, I'm the chair, so I'm just informing everybody <laughs> on how many we are on the list. You'll get the word very soon. <laughs> but I'm just saying this because I will appeal to short questions and short answers from now on because there are many on the list. It's okay. you, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm yeah, Domenico Borello from Sapienza. Thank you for um, your presentation. Um, I have uh, two small questions. First one, you didn't cite the direct use of hydrogen in um, steel industry or uh, uh, refineries. Imagine that you don't have many in Denmark. Could be this the reason. Uh, second one, I'm a bit curious about this uh, um, green route for aviation 2025. Can you explain something better what we are talking, you are talking about? Yeah, Thanks. maybe I haven't, uh, it's always, uh, you can remember what you said exactly. Uh, but yeah, uh, hydrogen for implementation in the industry is going to be very big part and it's also part of our analysis to, to use it directly in the industry. Uh, refineries, of course, that's a way of testing it. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that concept, but it's a good way of testing the large-scale uh, electrolysis and going with the first step of transitioning, but it can also result in lock-in in a way to continuing of using, because the green hydrogen is just a very small part of the production process there, right? Um, and then the thing about the domestic aviation, the green uh, target, yeah, it's not defined that it should be power to x fuels, it's uh, the green fuels or SAF. And actually, they are starting uh, to import uh, SAF right now uh, to stash it because we don't. We have a good trace record of following our targets, and I'm sure that we are going to meet the targets in 2025. Uh, not necessarily in the way that it was originally planned, but uh, it's it's going to be with some type of uh, SAF uh, that is uh, not necessarily going to be uh, power to x in the first round, even though we do have projects that should be up and running uh, until that point. Um, but uh, due to the delays, it's probably going to be more realistic to talk about it in 2030. Thank you very much. And the next <coughs> is here, and after you, it will be uh, Goran Karacic. Ilya Batas from Serbia, thank you very much. Uh, inspiring lecture, uh, system thinking is a part of control theory. So I'm thinking how this uh, thinking could, uh, could improve integrated assessment models like uh, locomotion is here uh, presented. Uh, because we are not uh, thinking only about the cheap fuel or expensive fuel, but many, many other things. Thank you. Yeah, of course, this can be and should be implemented on a, on a different levels, and it's going to be part of uh, the solutions to going forward. So it is a very important step as well uh, to to look at it in in, in different parts of uh, implementation. Also, when we talk about the optimization of the of the production facilities as well, uh, to think about that they are part of something out uh, as well and not necessarily only standing uh, on their own. So it is, uh, it is an important uh, part as well. Thank you. And the next is Goran Karacic. And then I will appeal because it was somebody here who raised his hand a long time ago. No, it was not you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> ah, I don't know how to do this. Uh, Goran, please. 
Thank you. Enrico, I have a short question and long comment. You know, no, so very good, first very good. of all, I'm uh, really proud that uh, you uh, select uh, Denmark to continue her career and that, that because she's now working in the group that is leading energy transition, I would like to say. But then, if you are not on the track in Denmark, there is no hope for us, you know, because, <laughs> you know, and yeah, yeah. So, uh, can you tell me what is the problem uh, uh, for this being late in energy transitions? Are those politicians? Are those maybe people or industry? Or maybe your voice is too silent in this global world, so we cannot uh, spread this uh, energy transition or uh, you know new energy systems, how we call it. But okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I'll try to avoid pointing fingers, right? Because we need to be <laughs> we need to be inclusive here. That's one of a one of a way forward. Um, I think it's multiple problems. It's not very one uh, one thing that that is going wrong or yeah not going as well or as planned. Uh, it's both the political targets, it's also the stakeholder, it's a blame game between them uh, about dealing the, um, who should uh, invest in what and to what extent. That's very much what was part of the debates in Denmark about that the government also needs to take share of the investments in order to make this uh, being re realized. So it is a bit of a com complex loops of, uh, of place there, uh, both uh, the politicians and the stakeholders. And I think the main thing that could potentially be at least the first solution going forward is to increase the carbon taxation price because uh, none of the industrial players are gonna do anything uh, before they are gonna be hurt uh, by having a high taxations because this is basically what can drive uh, the transition. The cheapest thing always wins, and we are very much aware that some parts of the green transition are not cheaper and never will be cheaper, including the power to X fuels. So thinking a bit about the taxations, thinking about what is hidden behind the prices of the fuels that we have today, and actually uh, establishing the fair market that we don't have right now, because obviously you can never win if you have the higher price, um, can, can change uh, the transition forward, I believe. Thank you, and I'm in a bit of a trouble here, but I will do my best. I know you, you're on the list, Ingo's also on the list, but I think it was you first on the fifth road here. And Reinhard, are you also on the list, and you also on the list, so uh, I'll try to come back to you, but you first. Okay, thank you for your perfect uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Hao Nan from North China Electric Power University. Uh, I have a short question. Uh, it is mentioned in the slide that uh, the hydrogen transmission uh, transportation is more cheaper, uh, is cheaper and safer than electric uh, transmission. Um, but in the traditional concept, I think uh, should uh, the electric transmission is more cheaper and safer. Yeah, so it was not safer whatsoever, uh, not from what uh, I'm aware of right now. Uh, the, the transportation of hydrogen is cheaper than transporting electricity uh, on the long distances. Uh, that is at least what all of the studies are showing so far. Uh, we are having a project uh, now that is gonna last for three years where we'd like to scratch a bit more. Uh, is that really uh, what the assumptions are uh, made there? But no, it is not safer, or at least we don't we never dealt on it on the large scale as uh, the plan is to do now, and they are still missing safety standards uh, in some of the countries at least. And Denmark not, uh, not having ever been a chemical uh, industry uh, producer or being, being a part of that is actually having a lot of work now uh, to establish the safety standards that you can actually implement and bunker these type of fuels uh, on harbors and also having the facilities that will produce these fuels in the system. So it is a very big part of uh, the transition forward to do it in the safety and, uh, way possible. Thank you so much. We have four questions back and we can read everything before lunch if we are a little short. So next is Ingo Stadler. Yeah, thank you. Um, the Danish are strange people. Eva, can you give us an insight into that people? 
<laughs> so you have shown that slide. You have 10 steps with meetings, documents, and then you had the national strategy for power to x When I look to my country, we have mountains of studies. Whatever your opinion and wish is, you can track five to six studies to uh, present your opinion. Whenever we have close uh, to a government decision, we have protests of trade unions, labor unions going to the street, have demonstrations. So how is the Danish people doing that they come such a short way to a decision? Yeah, I, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Ingo, for the question. Um, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't supposed to sound like it was ten steps and done and gone. Obviously, we didn't manage to implement it. Uh, it was a simplification of the major events that happened. Uh, there has been many things going on throughout these three years and many discussions across the stakeholders. I think what made the the, the difference here and why maybe the process was relatively fast. It was a very strong decision and a target to meet the seventy percent reduction. And then the stakeholders came together. So industry came together because they knew that if they are not proactive right now, they will pay uh, afterwards with the potential taxation. And uh, if they see the opportunity for, for businesses now, then they could uh, actually go and invest. So it's, uh, there is something about how the things are discussed. There is definitely a bit of a difference there. Um, it was also very clear from the beginning of the discussion in the 19 and then switching in, in 2020 and 2021 that the first, at the beginning, the academics had something to say, just kind of pointing out that we've been saying this for a while, uh, but then the, the players that got engaged in the discussions that were, had the more and more power uh, really came, came through. So a big uh, Danish uh, companies, uh, like mask and Rastel uh, as an electricity um, supplier developer. It's, it, the, there have been some power game there for sure. Um, and uh, coalitions have been made uh, across the thank, different types of stakeholders. Thank you very much, Eva. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Henry. <laughs> I can talk about this for <laughs> a <little. laughs> We have just room for two questions more. You first, and then. Oh, oh, and fortunately, then you. have two questions. Yes. <laughs> two questions. <laughs> Two ultra short questions. I'll try to make it short. The first one is a follow-up question with the gentleman afterwards. Uh, so we mentioned that uh, electricity transportation can be more expensive, but uh, uh, there are actually safer ways to transport hydrogen. For example, using uh, liquid organic hydrogen carriers, using repurpose natural gas or oil facilities. How do you view the, the, the future or perspectives of that? The second question is, uh, how do you see the difference of the role in biomass and peak power to gas for, uh, uh, like aviation for long haul? The gas, the, the biogas for the... A bio, biomass as the feedstock for SEF. Yeah. yeah. Well, there are different ways of producing SEF. I think there was some misunderstanding uh, here. I really am not a pro... Uh, what's a supporter of the hydrogen infrastructure whatsoever. I'm actually more and more concerned about the safety aspects as I talk with the people that work with the safety and I have a collaboration with the Danish Fire and Safety uh, Institute. So it's not really uh, talking to favor and more I talk about it, I get more concerned. So it's not, I'm not, it's, I don't believe it's safer and if we want to do it, we need to do it properly. But the thing with the, with the biomass, we can produce aviation fuel uh, with, without the carbon. Uh, and carbon, uh, if you want to have the green fuel, needs to come from a biogenic uh, source. So it's, uh, biomass is going to play there, but we need to just find the right pathway where you can minimize the use of biomass uh, to producing uh, SAF. And there are different ways to do that. But traditional SAF is not necessarily a way to go, and it's going to be present in the first part of the transition. But long term, we are going to see power to X and uh, advance maybe biofuels uh, as a part of the solution probably. Thank you, Eva, and we have room for just one last question. That will be you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, hello, and thank you for your um, presentation. Uh, so um, I'm Massimo Moser from Transit BW, a uh, German TSO. Uh, my question is regarding, uh, so Denmark again, and uh, so Denmark has a very, very good uh, wind power potential. And so it makes also make uh, economic sense in a European context uh, that uh, Denmark provides maybe more than 100 percent. And uh, how this uh, this um, this item is reflects uh, by the uh, power to X strategy or other discussion in Denmark. Thank you. 
Yeah, it is a, a part, like there are four main objectives to the strategy, one being making uh, Denmark a power to X exporter, including the fuel, but also technology exporter. So it's definitely a strong focus. And I think the motivation for the last at least a year or so was to establishing the infrastructure in order to uh, get the hydrogen to uh, northern Germany, uh, to industries and also to, to Netherlands. So the expert right now is really driving uh, the investments. Uh, so much that I'm sometimes concerned that it's a reason why we are potentially going to forget ourselves uh, in meeting our targets. Thank you so much. And I can inform you that we are so lucky that the two last people who wanted to ask questions have left the room. <laughs> They're probably already gone for lunch. So I think we should all uh, join them. But first, we will give a big applause for Eva. Thank you so much. Thank you.